Welcome to Brain Nevats. We are delighted to be joined by Nathan Kofnes, and we're going to be talking about race realism. Nathan, would you like to start with a thought experiment? So the instructions were to start with a thought experiment or a real life case. So uh, I'll describe a scenario that you can interpret either way. So if you don't think it really happened, then you can think of it as something that could have happened. Now, suppose our species originated in Africa. Uh, whatever it is that makes us unique, uh, language, morality, sophisticated political organization, all of it had evolved in a population of African hominins by at least 200,000 years ago. Uh, 50,000 years ago, some people left Africa and went on to populate other continents. Groups all over the world, uh, including groups within Africa, faced different conditions, which subjected them to different selection pressures. In some places, it was a fitness advantage to be short, uh, in others to be tall, or to have skin that absorbs more or less ultraviolet light, or to breathe at high altitudes or at sea level. Groups that were separated by distance or geographic barriers formed more or less isolated breeding populations. Because gene flow was limited, populations were uh, able to accumulate adaptations to their unique environments, which led to divergence of physical appearance. Uh, so you can often tell whether people are adapted to desert, snow, or jungle just by looking at them. Like other organs, the brain. Uh, was also subject to different selection pressures. To survive in the Arctic or the savanna requires people to solve different sets of problems. An Eskimo needs to fish in the ice. A bushman needs to track animals in the desert. Now, we solve these problems primarily by cultural adaptations. There are no genes specifically for ice fish fishing or animal tracking. Uh, over many generations, people figured out how to do these things by experience, and they transmitted the information culturally. But navigating different environments and mastering different bodies of cultural knowledge draw on different kinds of intelligence. Individuals who solve survival problems more easily have a fitness advantage. Because of this, the distribution of innate cognitive abilities became different across populations and we see differences in average brain size and structure. The question is, how would we deal with this situation? So I take it that what you're hinting at is that, firstly, that races may be real because they were distinct pockets of people that were separated such that there wasn't much gene flow between them. They were separated geographically. Um, and also a second claim that those races may have differences in their qualities. So they evolved to solve different problems, to survive in different situations. And so they're going to have different, different skills. Um, so am I on the right track? This is what you're arguing for. So of course I didn't use the word race. I just described, um, race raises all sorts of, um, associations, uh, but I've described the, the underlying reality um, in a, what I hope to be a neutral way. So there are populations, they evolve under different conditions. Um, now, should we call them races? Assuming that what I said, the thought experiment or the reality that I described, whatever it may be, suppose we accept that, uh, would that mean that race exists. So the term race realism, I think, uh, has two, uh, two meanings. First is that racial classification is, makes sense uh, and that it, it is rooted in a biological reality. Um, so if race referred to some uh, some property which is not instantiated in reality in actual biological populations, then race realism would be false. They would make would not be correct to divide people based on race. Uh, on the other hand, if it does correspond in the right way to some biological reality, then we would say race is real. Race realism in this sense is correct. The other 
um, the other meaning of race realism, which is the way I use it, is that not only is race real and racial classification a sensible way of dividing us biologically, but race is correlated with important traits such as intelligence. Um, and so race is sociologically relevant, uh, not just because of how we feel about it, but because of differences that exist independently of us. So let me hone in on that first question. Um, if race is real, how many races are there? And what are the set of necessary and sufficient conditions to be part of those particular racial groups? In the, the philosophy of biology, or the philosophy of race, uh, part of the philosophy of biology, this is often uh, described as a metaphysical question. So um, the metaphysical question of whether race is real and how many races are there, what are the properties of a race? Now, my view is this is a very pompous way of describing what is, in fact, a semantic question. It's not a metaphysical question. It's a semantic. We've got this word race. Um, we use it to communicate in certain contexts. Um, uh, biologically informed commentators have largely agreed on what it was supposed to mean until the the uh, uh, the waters were muddied by a lot of people kind of trying to create confusion so that we for political in my view political reasons uh, now there's no truth of the matter there's no objective truth how race ought to be defined uh, so those philosophers who are searching for the true definition of race, either implicitly or explicitly, I think are um, not, not doing something uh, that I find important or uh, on the right track. So the question is, when we use race, is there, is there a sensible way of using race that within our tradition of using that word and communicating scientific claims that makes sense, that is coherent, and that corresponds to to some reality. Now, uh, the the usual straw man definitions of race, which are widely accepted within the philosophy of race, are that races are uh, discrete; they're essences. There's no overlap whatsoever. Um, there's there's a red line separating all of the races that can never be crossed. Now, the people who define race in this way, of course, they are all anti-realists about race. So they say race is, is bad. We should reject it. One might notice that they never provide a quote, a reference to a post-Darwin biologist defining race in such a ridiculous way. And what race has always meant since Darwin is populations that share some kind of commonality due to common uh, inheritance. So more or less separate breeding populations. Now it was noticed even before Darwin that it was often impossible to make a sharp line between race, subspecies, species, and there, one population blends into another. So that was noticed before Darwin, and, and Darwin comments, comments about this in On the Origin of Species. And this was from the perspective of uh, those who believed in special creation, that each um, species was made, made uh, separately by God. This was a mystery. Why should because they predicted that no uh, no overlap god created you know this kind of this species of bird and that species of bird so they must have different purposes and god's divine plan so why would you have intermediaries or why would they be able why would they sometimes breed with each other the, that was a very strange 
phenomenon. But Darwin said, if you accept evolution, there's no mystery at all. It's there are these populations that are kind of related to each other. Maybe these are slightly more likely to breed with each other. These are more, but there's still some, some he didn't know about genes, but still some, uh, sometimes they would breed with each other. So Darwin tells us that there is no sharp line between one race and another. It's kind of arbitrary where you decide, how you decide to, to make these classifications. But however you make them, the guiding principle is heredity and common heredity um, based on dividing people, dividing members of the population along those lines. So one of the straw men used to attack uh, the idea of race, for example, De uh, uh, Jared Diamond, the anthropologist, says, well, race is arbitrary because you could divide people by skin color. So, and then uh, Australian Aborigines would be classified with Africans, but that's, uh, you know, genetically, they have nothing in, they're different populations. Like right? they form different genetic clusters. They've been separated for, for quite a long time. Or you could, uh, uh, divide, you could make, define race in terms of lactase persistence, the ability to digest dairy as an adult. And then, you know, there's one African population that can do it and Northern Europeans can do it. And so you have this race. So you see, it's all just uh, ridiculous. It's all nonsense. Yeah, but that's not what race was supposed to be. Race has never been about categorizing uh, a species based on some completely arbitrary characteristic, like how much they weigh or what color they are. It's about, so if an African is born as an albino, and there are some albinos who look more Swedish than they look African. Like that, that can happen. Um, nobody thinks that they should be classified as Swedish because that's not what race is. Race is not about just that a sign of the race. It's the certain phenotype is correlated with the race, but the race is the ancestry. And that's why 23 and me will recognize the albino as what he is and not classify him as uh, Swedish. Now, uh, genes, because they are inherited, are a very good indication of race, a basis for making racial classifications, because they tell you what your ancestry is. Uh, so when we look at genetic clusters, so you can, you take the whole human population. So we're all one species. And you divide people into two clusters, which are most closely related to each other. So you can divide them into two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you just do two, then it's, it's like you separate the sub Saharan Africans from everybody else. And then you, uh, if you add more clusters, then uh, the Caucasians form a cluster. Uh, Australian Aborigines, uh, uh, Australasians form a cluster, East Asians form a cluster. Basically, if you have like five, five to seven clusters, basically corresponds to common sense racial classifications, which indicates that uh, the racial classifications, racial categories that are used in common speech do largely track ancestry, uh, which is what race is supposed to track. And so now there are some exceptions. There are some, some racial categories which really are, are kind of arbitrary and confused. I mean, all, uh, none of them are perfect. Um, categories like Hispanic in the United States are obviously not really based on, on biological reality. Black includes, I mean, it's used in different ways in different, um, in different societies. You know, in America, if you're one eighth black, you can call yourself black, uh, which is sort of, they have different rules in Brazil um, and in other countries. But largely common sense racial categories track ancestry, which was what they're supposed to track. And, uh, 
therefore, this this largely vindicates uh, the common usage of of race. So I, I'm really glad that you said that this is a semantic problem rather than a metaphysical problem because that's the first thing I was going to argue in my objections. I was going to say this is not a metaphysical problem. You can't you can't discover some underlying metaphysics or deep science that explains our usage. Rather, we should look at our usage itself of racial terms and then understand what's going on with race in terms of how we speak about it. But you've already agreed to that, which is great. But then I think there's a deep problem with your view. There's a few. Okay, so the first one is, it seems like the average Joe on the street just doesn't understand enough about genetic structures and similarities and clusters of genetics to be referring to those when he looks at a person and says, you're black or you're white or you're Asian or you're Hispanic. Um, it just seems like that's not what we do in, in common discussion. Um, so I, I, I find it very strange to think that genetics would even form part of the account of race if what you think is going on here is a semantic question. So I want to put that aside for one moment, and I'd love to hear what you think about that. But the second part of the objection is, you said ancestry might be what's happening. So when someone talks about race, what they're talking about is, you come from certain ancestors. But that also seems a little bit odd. It doesn't seem like we're ancestry detection machines um, in our everyday lives. It just seems odd that humans have this inbuilt ancestry calculator in their heads that's able to say, just from a look at a person that you originate from this valley in the Kilimanjaro. That just seems weird to me. That seems like stuff one discovers through scientific inquiry rather than things that are sort of built into our semantic structure, into our language. That seems weird to me. I think it's a much more plausible account that when people look at other people, they cluster them according to phenotypical characteristics. That seems like a much more plausible account of the psychology involved when someone looks at someone else and says, you're of a certain race. And they're able to cluster different people into different races based on clustering of phenotypical features. That just seems like a much better account of what's happening when people look at each other and classify each other. <laughs> and maybe some evidence for this is, how do children classify people of other races? Uh, it seems like they can. It seems like maybe below a certain age they can't, but above a certain age they can. And it seems like they're definitely doing that based on phenotypical features rather than on some deep understanding of ancestry or, or DNA. Uh, I, in other words, I, I think that once you concede that this is a semantic problem, you've lost the position. Well, I did conflate uh, issues which might be might be separate, which are uh, what are the folk concepts of race and what are the scientific concepts of race, um, and then what are the the relation between those those things. Uh, so now, a lot of you, you refer to the average Joe. Um, the average Joe probably has a lot of pre-scientific views uh, about all sorts of topics, uh, and so would use some of the same terms which are used in science or, or philosophy uh, in a way which, upon examination, uh, like so as Socrates would subject him to, um, would be shown to be very problematic contradictory and not informed by discoveries of the last 500 years. Um, now, among children, uh, I mean, classifications are, are usually based on essentialist intuitions. So there is like a, um, which is presumably based on uh, just phenotype, their, their experience with the phenotype. So women have some essence their womanness, all things have essences for children. And the untutored intuition of adults, uh, I, 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 I believe, largely follows or is an extension of, of the childhood tendencies. So, yeah, I mean, when, um, when, when they do polls about, you know, what do you think about race relations? What do you think about the race? Uh, 
the average person probably hasn't really thought about it, kind of has a very vague concept that they look the same. Black people have black children. White people have white children. Uh, has, has sort of a collection of notions like that. Some of which I I think for the adult they it would be connected with ancestry. I mean the African blacks come from Africa, whites come from from Europe. I think even the average person has some uh, awareness of that. Um, but I would not want to defend all the usage of. Uh, the, sorry, in America. The average person would also say that Hispanic is a thing, which, of course, scientifically is not. Right? Uh, Hispanic means uh, it's kind of a linguistic uh, cultural category, which includes the descendants of the conquistadors and Mayans and uh, Spanish people who come over to America who are considered Hispanics and Mexican by the average Joe who 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 wouldn't understand that the average American would not would probably not know the difference between Mexico and Spain. Um, so our scientific concepts should should certainly not be hostage to the um, the common man's usage. Uh, but uh, I think the folk racial categories correspond closely enough to the scientific uh, scientific categories to be quite useful so that when the average man makes a statement about race it it it's not totally nonsensical so there's there's studies of uh the relation between uh, genes and racial self-identification in the united states if you say that you're black or white then that means your genes come from from Africa or or Europe. Like you can tell with nearly a hundred percent accuracy, uh, based on people's genes, how they're going to identify. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember if, if that works for Hispanics, but um, well, certainly for for Africans, for for black black people, white people, Asians. Folk racial, just the average person's self identification almost 100% corresponds to the genetic cluster of the continental race. So, um, yes, there's some, um, I agree, yes, there's some some confusion, but I don't think it undermines the race concept. So I want to talk about the second claim you make, which is that let's say there are these clusters, um, they're fuzzy, we don't have a set of Necessary and sufficient conditions. Maybe we've got a family resemblance concept that sort of says, well, you're probably uh, Caucasoid um, or you know, something along those lines because you have enough of the features for us to put you into that group. And maybe it's a little bit arbitrary how many of these classes we make, whether it's five or seven. Um, but we can speak uh, in a manner that's reasonably understandable while accepting that we're going to have a bunch of sororities paradox problems and some outlier cases. But you want to make the claim that um, there are differences between these groups. Um, what are those kinds of differences? Um, are they good, bad, or neutral? Um, are they entirely dependent on the context in which you find yourself? So, for example, if uh, one of those groups happens to be a lot taller and a lot more muscular, that might be the kind of thing that's uh, incredibly useful a thousand years ago. If you're for survival, you're going to beat off all your foes. Um, if your group is very, very good at solving hard mathematical problems, wasn't very good a thousand years ago, very, very useful now. Um, so are these things entirely context dependent? Are they like essential goods and are there uh, actual goods? So as I, I described in the, the thought experiment, so people are selected uh, because reproduction is non-random with respect to your ability to solve adaptive problems. Uh, Different populations face different adaptive problems. Then, they're, assuming there isn't too much uh, uh, gene flow between them, then there will be some uh, divergence. And some of these problems will involve cognition. So, the, it will be either um, not only more or less intelligence, but also different style of, of thinking, different way of um, analyzing analyzing 
information, all of that will, will potentially be subject to natural selection. Now, there is a concept of general intelligence, uh, which, I mean, maybe we can talk about more, but it's supposed to represent kind of the most uh, general characterization of intellectual ability uh, and a finding from psychology is that uh, more is basically better. Uh, there's no disadvantage. It's not negatively correlated with anything. It's positively correlated with all desirable outcomes. Uh, so that would, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's some objective mind-independent standard with that uh, determines whether something is good or bad. There's no point of view of the universe that says intelligence is good or, or intelligence is uh, neutral or bad. But from a normal perspective that we would take, intelligence, general intelligence tends to be good. And uh, the evidence um, overwhelmingly suggests that uh, populations differ in the distribution of general intelligence and that this is... Uh, uh, largely, uh, and that this difference persists even when environmental conditions are largely equalized. So um, that would be somewhat, uh, from a social perspective, unfortunate result because it creates all sorts of problems. Now, it would be one thing if you said, well, you know, East Asian strength is in uh, visuospatial reasoning and um, you know, Europeans are more a little more verbal, and not not such a big deal, right? But if there are massive differences in just general intelligence, and some people just tend to score you know lower across the board, um, and then this leads to uh, uh, disparities in socioeconomic status, which are social socially disruptive. Uh, it's hard to see why that's a good thing, but. Yeah, the evidence uh, does indicate that, that that's the case. So there have been a few criticisms of that literature. Um, one of the criticisms is that general intelligence, which is often just um, abbreviated as G, uh, is measuring something which is more available in certain social contexts than in others. So um, the idea would be that the questions in those tests are more easily answered by someone living in America than they would be to someone living in the Philippines, for example, just because of everyday cultural practice um, that those questions really access. And someone who doesn't grow up in that environment is less likely to be able to learn the skills required to answer that question. And then the second part of the answer would be or well, the second part of the objection would be, but that that doesn't mean that that person in the Philippines is less intelligent. I take it that your position is quite sophisticated because you you're not necessarily denying that. You're just saying that G or general intelligence correlates with positive outcomes, um, and so you're saying regardless of whether that person is less likely to be able to learn it in the Philippines they would do better off in life if they were able to acquire the skills to answer that general intelligence question correctly. Am I getting that right? So if you give uh, a, an intelligence test to somebody in the Philippines and somebody in America, that tells you nothing about the genetic basis of, of differences. Um, so your performance on IQ tests is highly uh, uh, influenced by, by your, your cultural background. Uh, so there was an attempt at one point, to to develop so-called culture fair IQ tests, so that involved like pattern recognition, uh, which was not verbal, so you don't have to know how to read. There are no numbers. You don't have to know any math. It's just here's a pattern, and what what comes next, right? So you give these to uh, hunter gatherers or people with no schooling, and they will get the equivalent of like. Uh, a 20 uh, IQ, but they, they cannot do it. Now, that is not their true potential. Like, that does not represent their potential. It's just we take it for granted that because we're so familiar with these kinds of tests, 
and we've seen it a million times. We've been growing up with, and with with testing and and this and the idea of science and scientific classifications. So it feels like we we feel like we never learned it, and it was just innate. But in fact, we did. And if we'd grown up as hunter gatherers, we would get scores of twenty as well. Uh, but then within Western societies, um, there's a very well known finding that IQs have been increasing steadily over the course of the 20th century, although that trend has now stopped and even reversed. So this is called the Flynn effect, where uh, um, scores on IQ, basically, if, uh, if uh, the average man from 1920 were to take an IQ test, uh, it would be like you'd get a 70 or something, whatever whatever it works out to be. Uh, you know, even, and that was, they, they had some education, they had some experience with tests, but not enough. Uh, so we got more and more schooling, more and more familiar with how to take tests. It was only after we reach a very high level that we achieve our, our potential to ace IQ tests. And at a certain point, then that doesn't go on forever. You kind of reach the limit of how much schooling is going to help you, and uh, that just is your maximum genetically possible uh, IQ. Now, you never know where on this progression another culture, another society is. So if you look at the Philippines, are they reaching their potential? No way to know, right? Uh, and whether... The IQ test that's given to Americans translates into uh, to their culture, their background, so that it can be comparable. It tells you nothing. the The way that we know that there, the, the real evidence for uh, race differences in intelligence, comparing people who are living under comparable conditions. The best studied gap is between blacks and whites in the United States, where we have a cross-racial adoption study. So black children adopted soon after birth and raised by middle-class uh, white families who uh, grow up to have average IQs, which are roughly the same as African-American average. Uh, uh, there are a number of sources of evidence um, in addition to this. Uh, the fact that within uh, the United States, we have found virtually no environmental um, variables which are associated with differences in intelligence. Early intervention programs have been failures uh, to, to attempting to raise the IQ of black children. Very intensive, expensive interventions. Uh, some of the most expensive uh, experiments ever done in the history of psychology have focused on this question and completely failed. Nobody has been able to identify some factor which uh, could explain the gap. And at a certain point, if you continually fail to find any plausible uh, environmental explanation, then the genetic explanation becomes uh, far, far more plausible. Particularly now, there are also physiological differences, for example, differences in brain size, uh, which are brain sizes correlated with uh, general intelligence. There's a uh, rac racial differences in brain size, Africans, whites, and East Asians having uh, the largest brains. Uh, so all of the evidence is pointing in, uh, in one direction which is genes playing a, a huge role. So just to try and understand your position first, it's that it's quite hard to get an accurate assessment um, of intelligence if you have different kinds of social structures across the world. Um, it might be that when you're comparing I IQ scores around those places, if you look at, let's say the South African average, I think is 84, and the Mongolian average is 104. Um, you know, there's a sort of map of the world that shows you IQ. It might be that those are actually incomparable. Um, Jason and I have been having a conversation about um, 
whether men and women uh, who play chess uh, have differences in intelligence. So it is the case that you have uh, a segregation in chess. So there's an open tournament in which men and women can play and trans people can play. And then there is a women's tournament. And the women's tournament uh, doesn't allow men and doesn't allow uh, trans women either. And this is sort of puzzling. We understand sex segregation in things like swimming and running because there's all these uh, strength factors that you get that seem strange in chess. Um, and so the one argument is that, well, women just aren't that smart, aren't that very good at chess, and you have to have this special league for them. Um, and there's an article um, uh, that's just come out of Gwilet that tries to unpack these kinds of differences and finds that, well, actually, there isn't a big benefit you get from a high IQ score at a certain level. There's a saturation point where there are other things that start to play a role. Maybe men are more competitive. But Jason had a very interesting thought, which is that when the comparisons are turned between the two groups, the uh, highest ranked um, female chess player I think has an ELO score of around 2,600. Um, and that equates to about the 300 uh, male player. And the thought was this, which is that your ELO score might not be a universal number, that it's partly determined in relation to the field in which you compete. And so because the male field is so big, because there's so many male chess players in comparison to female chess players, you actually wind up with a distortion. So it might be that those ELO scores are not translatable. And maybe a similar thing is happening in IQ. Uh, it definitely happens with regards to grades. So Americans are notorious for grade inflation. Um, in South Africa, when we have American students at our universities, um, you get a 75 here, which is a first, um, and it would get turned into a 90 when you went to America because they understood that um, that's the sort of different grading system. Um, and so the grades don't translate. So maybe there's something like that going with IQ. But your further claim is this, is that once you have... Um, the same kind of societal, societal conditions. So everyone's in America, everyone's gone to the same public schools, everyone's got similar opportunities. You're still finding this difference in score and difference in ability. And that that's manifesting in, um, as you say, social problems. So some groups are doing better in the environment than other groups. So if there is this hereditary disparity among groups uh, and that it is not socially caused, um, and in America, that would be hard to work out because, of course, there is a history of racial discrimination, um, as there was in South Africa. And so maybe there's other kinds of things that still need to play out. But assume for the sake of argument that there is the hereditary difference. What are the kinds of social policies one ought to adopt if there are such differences? The, the first uh, policy is that we have to treat it as a different kind of problem than what we're, how we're used to treating it. So right now, disparities are treated as a proof of racism. So, or it's either current racism or the legacy of past white racism. And uh, therefore, certain people from the higher performing groups are going to be blamed. Uh, and that would be an, a wrong uh inference to make that if it's mother nature who is responsible for this crime, uh, then you shouldn't go around hunting for uh, the racists, uh, because they're not the ones who are, who are responsible. And if you think, I mean, if you really think that everybody, all, all populations have identical distributions of, uh, innate, uh, ability it's a very strange world we're living in. Like, what is causing these huge disparities and differences in, in, in behavior, which are re replicated, you know, all over the world, where you have population representative uh, groups of, of certain people, uh, and that is what wokeism is. Like, so wokeism is what happens when you take this thesis seriously, that we're all literally the same, and yet. Somehow, the, these differences continue to exist, and that is a, can, interpreted as a moral emergency. And wokeism is the attempt to find the hidden racism, which is producing this terrible outcome. So wokeism will be will be over. Um, the whole woke uh, DEI industry will be over, and then there will be a discussion about uh, well. 
Are we just going to have a colorblind society where in certain positions, certain groups are, are really not going to be represented anywhere near their, uh, their, their proportion in the population? Is that acceptable? Will we have to have some, some kind of quota system, which I think at least in the short, short term will, will probably be necessary. Uh, I mean, can you really have a, a society where certain people are just not represented, you know, in certain decision-making institutions? I don't think that's, in my view, realistic. Uh, and so I think, so we'd have to think through what, what would an acceptable quota system look like? And, you know, we don't need quotas for air traffic control necessarily, but for, um, uh, for government positions, uh, for bureaucratic positions, maybe uh, that's as far as policy goes. And then there's a, I mean, it's a, from a philosophical and scientific perspective, it's a bonanza uh, to understand human evolution, uh, questions of identity and ethics and political philosophy, and there are enormous implications. So maybe it's worth pushing back against um, your claim that there's no environmental factors that have been shown to explain differences in general intelligence, and that there's sufficient evidence based on transracial or interracial um, adoption studies. So, sorry to interrupt, but that's within like middle class Americans, not in general. So. Uh, so environment has a big role on, on intelligence, but any kind of environmental differences that exist within middle-class Americans don't tend to explain differences among the children that they raise. Well, it, it could just be that we don't have enough information um, and that we haven't found the magic formula. It could be that the the influences, the variables involved are so complicated that you just need a sophisticated enough black box AI to put all the data in. Once you get enough data in, you can start getting predictions out that match reality. It could be that we're not there yet, rather than that we can't be there. And then the second part of the objection would be, we can push against interracial studies as providing sufficient evidence for a true genetic cause. Uh, or, or ancestral cause um, for general intelligence differences. So it seems like what those um, interracial adoption studies are relying on, if you're thinking that this is a good reason for thinking about general intelligence in populations as a whole, um, or in, in racial groups as a whole, is you're assuming that those children that are adopted are um, generally representative of people of that race. So black child that is adopted by a white middle-class American family is generally representative of black people as a whole. Um, and that just might be a false assumption. There might be a lot of reasons why they're not representative. Uh, yeah, so th this was discussed, um, the last point was discussed um, in the study, I and mean, they made some, some attempt to understand that. Um, I... Uh, uh, I don't want to get the details wrong, but I mean they did. They were aware of that uh, those issues, and uh, I think there was no particular. Their, their conclusion was there was no particular reason to think that that was a big factor. Um, now, one another piece of evidence uh, against the um, the theory that uh, the, the, there's a problem with the adoptees, or that uh, these exper there's a problem with the, the subject of other intervention studies, is that in childhood, adoption actually increases IQ very substantially. So there's actually almost no difference between uh, white and black, or, or the difference is very narrow. So now it's also true that the heritability of IQ is quite low in childhood. So it becomes more heritable as you age. It was only when they reached their early 20s that their IQ uh, reverted back to the African-American mean. Now, if your hypothesis were it's just because they, were, they were, had some kind of brain damage or, or something like that, then they should have uh, manifested the brain th th that problem f from the beginning when they were children. So they should have had lower IQs 
as soon as they were given IQ tests when they were three, four, five, six years old. Uh, but instead, the pattern that we observed was consistent with the hereditarian uh, hypothesis, which is as IQ becomes more and more heritable, it reflects your environment less and less and reflects, reflects your uh, genetic potential. And so you end up just as your, your genetic potential. And you referred to the, uh, the magic formula that we may have failed to discover that um, will, will identify the environmental factors that are responsible for these differences. I think that was the right word uh, to describe it, but because we're really, after all these decades and decades, we're waiting for the magic uh, to come and explain how, how to rescue the environmental thesis. In any other area of science, when you try a thousand hypotheses to, to, to defend one, uh, explanations to defend your hypothesis, and they all fail, and there's an alternative hypothesis which explains everything perfectly sensible and consistent with other evidence in addition, uh, why are these patterns repeated in other societies with different histories, and why is the general history of the world roughly consistent with the kind of results that we've been getting um, in studies in America. Um, if this were not a politically sensitive issue, I don't think that this um, this kind of reasoning would, would be taken very seriously. I want to give you one more objection, uh, Nathan, which is not something that, it's not an objection that denies your data. So I'm just assuming your data is correct and your empirical claims are correct but it might uh, present a different interpretation of what's happening metaphysically. So um, just, just for the record, I don't necessarily agree with your data and your conclusions, but let's just assume that they're true. Um, one way of understanding the information that you get when you look at different race groups and their average IQs is to say, well, the race of the person is causally responsible to some degree for their IQ score. So that's one conclusion you can draw. And I assume that that's a conclusion that you're drawing. You can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but a second conclusion you might draw is that a person's perceived race is correlated with some underlying feature. It could be a genetic feature. And that genetic feature is actually causally responsible for that person's race. And it's the second interpretation that feels to me more plausible it seems to me like a person's race wouldn't, it's, it's mysterious to me how that is a causal factor in their, in, their, uh, in their IQ, but it's entirely understandable why certain genetic features would determine our IQs. It seems, for example, like if you're Down syndrome, it makes sense that you're going to have a different IQ average score to someone who's not Down syndrome. That seems to be quite a plausible thing to say. It's fairly uncontroversial, and there's a pure genetic explanation there. Um, so one might say that, okay, certain clusters of people are more likely to have certain uh, DNA, but that's not the interesting component. What's interesting is whether you have the particular DNA, and that is causally responsible for your IQ score, at least, or maybe tends to lower your IQ. IQ score or raise your IQ score or give you some sort of ceiling on your, your possible IQ scores that you could obtain in your life, even if you get all the environmental factors right. It seems like that second claim is a lot more plausible and a lot less controversial than the claim that your race is causally responsible. Well, I, I agree 100% with the second claim, except that I don't think it's any less controversial. But I mean, that was a claim that I was intending to make. Like, it's it's not be, be, because I'm a Jew, I have a big nose. It's that's correlated with it's just on average the the no, the nose size is bigger than in a certain population. Um, there are Jews with you know small noses. Uh, and it's and there's some genetic basis for that. It's not be being a Jew, but the. the People with my ancestry have the the genes which are associated with that phenotype. Uh, it's the same with intelligence. There's also a psychometric profile, which is uh, there's no law of nature that says because I'm a Jew I have to have this 
um, these dispositions, this level of intelligence. It's just the average and and the, and the variants are a certain way in my population, and therefore I'm statistically more likely to fall within a certain range uh, than somebody from a different population. But it's not the race that's causally doing anything. It's just ancestry is associated with inheriting uh, certain genes, which then are correlated with the phenotype. But, but I, I, I think that is controversial like, because I'm saying that then race is associated with, with differences. Well, well, what I'm saying is if you accept that version or that interpretation of the data, you needn't be a race realist to believe in differences in IQs across the population uh, that correlate roughly with people's ancestry because that correlation is irrelevant. What matters is the particular DNA strand that certain people have that makes them more likely to answer general intelligence tests better. So in other words, you needn't believe in the existence of races to hold that view. Well, w would one deny that the people of a certain ancestry have traits that are more likely to be in common or, or clusters of, of traits, and because that would be what race is, right? Yeah, it, it may or may not be true that people with certain ancestry are more likely to have certain genetic structures. That may or may not be true, um, but that seems like an independent and less interesting question than whether those genetic structures are responsible, causally responsible for their their general intelligence. So in other words, it seems like the realism about this group, these racial groups, is a totally independent question to whether certain people are genetically favored on IQ tests. No, I mean, that's that's true. I mean, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, um, so race realism can have two interpretations. One is just that the racial classification is a sensible concept. So this is what, uh, there are race, some race realists in the philosophy of biology who are um who just believe that yes there are these genetic structures the clusters uh, uh correspond to racial categories therefore race is real so there are but then they deny that there's any significance to race right so any significance that we attach to it is all just a social construct and there are no important it's just skin deep and um so and that's a, a a logical view. It's an empirically incorrect view, uh, I would say. But logically, you can you can separate them. But to say, uh, am I uh, correct that that you you think maybe one could say believe in the second kind of race realism, but not the first? Or? Yeah, because I mean, I I let it go earlier because because we had to keep the conversation going, but. I think you've made some errors in in your thinking about um, a semantic problem uh, having a scientific solution. So it seems to me that if 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 what you're saying is that the average Joe could not know about ancestry to the degree that we need to to understand race concepts properly, and if the average Joe can't understand DNA properly. Um, or doesn't understand DNA properly, but the average Joe can still classify races with almost perfect accuracy if we were to understand accuracy as according with the scientific explanation of race or the ancestry plus DNA explanation of race, then you've just got a bad account of race because he gets it right. He gets it right. And he speaks the, the same way as all of us speak. And if common usage and common speaking about race is what matters, well, well, then it can't be a genetic explanation. So it breaks, it breaks the implication from the one form of realism to the other. So you can be a DNA realist about intelligence without being a race realist about intelligence. So I think the phrase that I often use is that folk racial categories correspond to a biological reality. So I don't say that we should define race according to the sophistication of the average Joe. Um, so I don't know if that would address your, your objection. But in order to, maybe we could think about it, uh, to use another example that might have uh, less, less baggage. So what about language? So the concept of language 
on my view, would be uh, very similar to, to uh, racial classification. So the, when you don't know exactly where one language, how far into the hills of Appalachia do you have to go before hillbilly twang becomes its own dialect? When does accent become dialect, become a language? There is no red line. People just kind of use words. They borrow words and grammatical structures from each other. Uh, it's more, you can sort, sometimes you can understand them, sometimes you can't. You know, Korean, South Koreans have adopted thousands of, of uh, words from English, which makes uh, communication with North Koreans awkward. Do they speak different languages? Is South Korean its own language? Uh, you know, as, as, uh, in Austria, do they speak the same language as in Germany? So <clears throat> now, my view would be uh, there are no real answers to this question. How, how you, it's just really just a matter of opinion and convenience and, and maybe some culture, cultural considerations, how you define what, what is a language, what is not a language. Uh, but first, there is a reality out there in the world. There is variation. Uh, so it's not just a hallucination, not just a social construction. Chinese really is a different language from English, even though you can't give necessary and sufficient conditions to explain where one, one stops and another begins. Uh, and the average man on the street would not be able to articulate anything that I just said, would probably you know, struggle to, to come up with a, a definition. I mean, because it, even smart uh, introductory philosophy students have to get used to this kind of you know, concept of providing definitions and anticipating counterexamples. The average person is not going to be able to do that, but I don't think that threatens the concept of language, the usefulness of language, the fact that the average person would, uh, would fall short here. So you mentioned that it's a politically controversial subject matter, right? That talking about IQ on its own has become very controversial. There's been a move to try and say that, well, it's irrelevant. Uh, we shouldn't care about general intelligence at all. I tested this out with some grad students when I was in Memphis, and I said to them, imagine you have someone who has an IQ of 75, so they can't get into the military because they have a requirement there, I think, 85. Um, and you could give them a pill with absolutely no side effects, and it would give them an IQ of 130 instantly. So they're not going to be burdened by genius. They're not going to be you know, over 145, but you know, they're going to have this higher IQ. Is it a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing? And the grad student did this long pause and scratched his chin and his head, and he said, you know, I just don't know how to answer that question. And I thought, that is so deeply dishonest uh, that it shows you how much your education has absolutely failed you that you cannot say that it would be better to have an IQ of 130 than 75. It's become so politically impossible to give me a straight answer that you are lying to me. The grad student got very upset with me. Um, and uh, went and consoled himself with uh, a whiskey sours. But um, what subject is was he studying? Philosophy. Um, yeah. So that's just on the IQ question. Now, of course, once you add in race and IQ, I mean, you're just asking to be tarred and feathered, right? I mean, how how dare you uh, go down this line of inquiry? I mean, shouldn't we just uh, torture you in the public square? Um, and it seems that there might be some reason why people get uncomfortable with this. So that's legitimate. In other words, throughout human history, claims have been made that some groups are inferior to other groups and that we should uh, exterminate them or treat them harshly or enslave them. Um, and so, you know, as Jews, we think about how um, we were treated in Europe, uh, how we're being treated now. Uh, and we think, you know, it's quite dangerous to set up these kinds of uh, racial hierarchies. Um, you know, if you think about uh, apartheid or the history of um, Jim Crow or slavery in America, you know, black people have a lot to complain about in terms of their ill treatment. And so the idea that different races have different abilities could come with a very pernicious political structure, which is that you treat them like intervention uh, and you exterminate them or you treat them like chattel. And so there might be good political reasons to act as if people are equal. Um, we had an episode with Brian Leiter talking about uh, Nietzsche and the Ubermensch and we recognize that societies that don't believe in the value of equality tend to do really terrible things. Um, and maybe it's not true that people are equal in all facets, but maybe we should pretend. Uh, 
or you want to grant people some kind of like equal moral worth, uh, even if they don't have the same abilities. I mean, I know that I don't have the same abilities as certain elite sports people. It would be uh, horrendous for me to try and compete with them in uh, a soccer match or you know running around the field, or you know, they're just going to beat me senseless because of their you know innate genetic capacities. Uh, and pretending otherwise seems foolish. But when we're dealing with you know other kinds of goods that we're distributing in society, maybe it's a good idea to pretend. Well, this is what motivated the taboo to be established in the first place. Uh, was the um, uh, race differences were used, of course, to justify slavery. Uh, a uh, tactic of the abolitionists was to say there are no differences, uh, thus undermining one of the a principal argument for slavery that slaves are not uh, Africans are not capable of autonomy and so on. Uh, and then, of course, after World War II, uh, these ideas were considered morally discredited, and uh, the uh, the egalitarians who just said no, everybody's the same. That's the moral position. Um, they very much had the upper hand. Uh, and then that was when the, the the taboo was established. You know, in the early days, people didn't really believe this. Everyone's the same. People didn't actually think that, but they decided we're going to start teaching children uh, this idea, and we'll just we're going to have a better world. And then a few generations later, suddenly people actually believe it, and you know, we get wokeism, which is the attempt to well, why if everyone's the same, do we still have these disparities? Now. Yes. Uh, well, well, there are a few things that, that you can say. I, I don't think that that is a, uh, uh, something that, an outcome that we really need to, to worry about. And yes, I mean, I guess if you can imagine it, I guess it's possible, right? So people learn about differences and then they decide to go around murdering people of another race. Uh, now, that will also have to be weighed against the dangers of continuing with the noble lie. Which is that, as these these disparities are going to be blamed on certain on the better performing race, or better performing with respect to some outcome people care about, uh, and that is also creating a lot of racial tension, and nobody knows exactly where that's going to lead. It, it's not only the hereditarians who have uh, a record of mass murder, right? The uh, the egalitarians and the blank slatists have. In fact, a higher body count than the Nazis. Uh, whether I'd rather live, I, probably I'd rather take my chances in somebody's attic in Nazi Germany uh, rather than Mao's China or, or Cambodia. Uh, but um, some other relevant facts are that there's never been. A, uh, a genocide based on actual scientific data about race differences. The Nazis, they didn't even believe in Darwin. They believed in world ice theory, this bizarre creation story. Uh, and they didn't believe that races were related to each other. They denied IQ testing because they didn't like the results. They said IQ testing is a tool of world Jewry uh, to subjugate them. Uh, there were notorious pseudoscientists in anthropology. Uh, it was just from, uh, it was just pseudoscience, ideologically motivated pseudoscience. Now, the fact that ideologically motivated pseudoscience in the service of a uh, genocidal ideology was associated with genocide, in my mind, doesn't tell us what would happen if we, in our society, in a responsible way, confronted some of this uh, information. And look, everybody, most people accept the fact that not all individuals are born to be an Einstein. Uh, there's some people who are just limited, and there's zero evidence that anybody wants to murder the less intelligent. And within just just looking at whites within the white race, so called so called white race, nobody wants to murder. In fact, in the United States, they have way more 
funding to uh, so-called special education, which means for the low IQ, than for the gift for gifted education, because everybody cares about taking care of of those who are less well endowed. So, I just don't see why one would think you can imagine it that somehow learning about race differences triggers this chain of events leading to some horrible outcome. Yeah, I I can imagine it. I just don't see any reason to think that's going to happen. And I do see a reason to think that something bad is going to happen if we continue denying the differences, living with these disparities and and you know, as I said, we don't know where that is going to lead to. So, as you can see probably um on the show, at least one of the hosts of the show disagrees with you. Um, but we, of course, invited you on the show and you're very welcome to be here and you're very welcome to come back. And I think that even if I disagree with some of your conclusions, your arguments um, are very well presented. Um, but I take it that the, the Philosophy Academy in general does not, it's not as receptive as Mark and I are on this show to controversial positions. Um, how does the academy generally, generally respond um, to positions that don't conform with the egalitarian premise? Uh, so the main strategies are uh, retracting papers, firing editors, obviously not hiring the person uh, who, who talks about the uh, the politically incorrect idea in the first place, or if they do get hired, then to fire them. Um, and then also uh, social media the smearing and, and that kind of thing. So I guess those are the five strategies. Um, now, the missing strategy is, of course, engagement, uh, discussion, talking about ideas, uh, looking at evidence. But that's not, that rarely plays a role um, when it comes to controversial issues in philosophy. Um, so as listeners may know, uh, I, 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 I published a paper in uh, philosophical psychology um, in the end of uh, 2019 called "Research on Group Difference, Differences in Intelligence: A Defense of Free Inquiry." So it was partly framed as a response to Janet Karani, uh, professor at uh, Notre Dame, who published a paper in Philosophy of Science saying that co research on cognitive differences should be restricted. So we shouldn't be allowed because it's too dangerous. But if people would find out something, some, some information about uh, differences in intelligence, that would have terrible social implications. So we should not be allowed to do that. Just like we have restrictions on you know, publishing instructions on how to make uh, you know, bioweapons, uh, which are, I think, reasonable. Uh, uh, so we should have the same thing for, for dangerous social science. So I was responding to her and a number of um, prom very prominent scientists and philosophers have said that we should not study intelligence differences. It's too, too dangerous. We don't want to know what, what the truth is. Um, and people like Noam Chomsky and Howard Gardner, uh, Ned Block at one point had said this, but then he changed. I guess he realized that strategy didn't work, so he came up with some some philosophical objection. Uh, why to to this research program? So anyway, I published this in uh, in, in in December 2019, and as part of the paper, uh, my main goal was just to justify research to say we shouldn't ban the research. But as part of that. I wanted to make the case that this research is uh, scientifically legitimate. There is something. It's um, it's not only racism that would motivate one to care about this problem. So I did talk about some of the evidence for race differences, although I didn't really take a position on it uh, in the paper. Now, there was a uh, campaign led by um, a philosopher Mark Alfano to uh, he started a petition to retract the paper and i guess fire the editors and then then this petition was featured on uh, the daily news and it didn't get 
uh, a very positive response, didn't get that many signatures. It was certainly, um, you know, the, the point was to harm my reputation. And in the end, there was a group of philosophers who, who lobbied the editorial board to publish their reply to me without me being allowed to write a rejoinder. And they also refused to make some very minor ed, uh, revisions that the editors had asked them uh, to do. So the editorial board then went over the heads of the edit the two editors in chief, and to protest. And they accepted their their reply to me, which just said, you know, I'm racist, whatever. Uh, and then they said, I'm not allowed to write a rejoinder. Then one of the editors in chief uh, resigned in response to that, and the other editor in chief was replaced. Uh, many ed uh, members of the editorial board were re replaced, and they they hired uh, new editors who promised that they would you know, never do something like that again. It would from now on be a very politically correct journal. Now, I also had a, an exchange. There's another debate in which I take actually the politically correct position which is on uh, the, uh, the so-called Jewish question. So this is, there's a theory which is uh, promoted by a psycho American psychologist, Kevin McDonald, who says that Judaism is a group evolutionary strategy and that Jews have a suite of, uh, of genetic and cultural adaptations to undermine Gentile society. So that would include high intelligence and conscientiousness and ethnocentrism and then cultural practices to bind the group together and, and attack the, the, the non-Jews. Uh, and he, he was a professor of psychology and he published uh, his ideas with a, uh, a university press, but Prager, uh, and was taken somewhat seriously by some, some academics. So I had an exchange with him uh, and in several journals, including in Philosophia, uh, which used to be called the, uh, at the time, the Philosophical Quarterly of Israel. So I published a, uh, a paper about his theory called The Anti-Jewish Narrative, criticizing him. And he published a reply to me in Philosophia, was accepted and published. The day after his paper was published, uh, one of the associate editors of Philosophia resigned. Uh, then the Daily News ran a uh, a um, a blog post about how horrible it was that McDonald had been published. And in the end, McDonald's paper got retracted above my, uh, despite my strong objections. I wrote an article defending his right to uh, academic freedom in Quillette. Uh, I lobbied as hard as I could behind the scenes to save his paper, but I couldn't do it. So I'm regularly smeared, you know, on the Daily News. Uh, Daily News ran an article, uh, uh, a guest post saying that I advocate racial segregation in education, which is ridiculous. Uh, not something, not something I said. Not something was scientifically justified, but people. In philosophy, they'll just go after uh, you personally if you uh, if you cross the line. Well, Nathan, I'm proud to say that um, Brain Nevada is a safe space for dangerous ideas. We've hosted a whole host of weird and wonderful positions, um, some we disagree with, some that we agree with. I think it's intentionally the case that we don't let on for our viewers what our private views are. Um, and I think most people that are on the show feel like it's a, a space where they can uh, test ideas, they can change their minds, they can put out wild propositions, um, and often in a way that's quite different from academic classrooms uh, around the world, and that's a great shame. But it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. And if you are listening to the show on Spotify, we have turned on a new feature that allow you to send us a voice note, and you can let us know what you think about race realism, whether you think races are real, um, whether you think there are differences in IQ, um, we'd love to hear from you.